I'm doing a series of videos on adverse selection in health insurance. And this is one of my favorite things to teach in class because I get to shock students. Um, adverse selection is pretty amazing when you finally get how important it is for health insurance markets and anytime really when there's competition in healthcare. So this first video is about the concept of race you to the bottom. I hope it introduces you to the general idea of selection in health insurance and in particular adverse selection in health insurance. Now the first thing you need to understand is the way that healthcare spending is distributed across the population. In particular, there are a, there's a small number of really sick people who consume the greatest number of healthcare dollars. So you can see this graph about 22% of healthcare dollars go toward people who are the sickest 1% of the population. And about half of healthcare dollars go toward the sickest 5% of the population. And then the bottom 50%, the healthiest people in the economy, spend only about 3% of healthcare dollars. Now the second thing you need to understand is that it's somewhat predictable who will be in the top, top spending group. Now, of course, you can always, healthy people do get cancer, but a lot of this top spending group is group who, when they buy their health insurance, assuming they buy it once a year, they kind of know what, what category they're going to be in. So who is this top 1% of healthcare spenders? This is going to be people in the last six months of their life. It's going to be people with cancer. It's going to be people with multiple chronic conditions. So this would be people who have diabetes and lung disease and cancer and chronic depression. They have a number of different conditions that make them very complicated patients. So oftentimes these patients are bouncing between doctors and our healthcare system does not do a very good job of caring for patients who need that much coordination in their care. It's a problem in the healthcare system and I will probably eventually do a series on that. Now the concept of race you to the bottom um, is very ironic because in normal economics, competing firms compete to attract the most customers and with normal products that aren't health insurance, this means you compete to see who can provide the highest quality product for the customer. So competition will drive up quality, it'll drive up innovation because of these natural competitive forces. That's normal economics. With healthcare and adverse selection and race you to the bottom in particular, you have the concept of health insurers competing to keep out the top 1% of healthcare spenders. So you might imagine looking at this graph, if you can avoid that top 1% of healthcare spenders somehow, what that means is you can cut costs for everybody else, cut prices for everybody else by 20%. If you can avoid the top 5% of healthcare spenders, you can cut prices in half. Or you could use that extra money to improve the quality, either one. So avoiding the top 1% and the top 5%, it might be something that insurers would compete over, in which case, how do you avoid the top 1% of healthcare spenders? You make sure that they don't want your healthcare. You make sure that people who are really sick are not attracted to your health insurance. And that basically means providing low quality care. So insurers in this case, instead of competing to see who has the highest quality product, they can compete to keep that top 1% out, meaning basically compete to see who can provide the lowest quality of care for the people who actually experience the care and, and know uh, the quality of the healthcare of a particular insurer. Now, another way I like to explain this is imagining um, two women who are healthcare administrators who are charged with putting together not-for-profit health insurance plans. We might imagine we're in a country like Germany where insurers are not allowed to be for profit. And so you just have um, these leaders of the not-for-profit organizations who are really just trying to serve their customers. And we're going to imagine that the two women have different philosophies. The first one is going to be a Rawlsian, and this means that she focuses on the sickest 1% of the population. She focuses on the most vulnerable. Um, the person whose utility she's trying to maximize is the person who's worst off in society, and that's her focus for her health insurance plan. 
Um, the other woman is going to be a utilitarian, so she is trying to maximize the collective utility of everyone. Her social welfare function is just adding up everybody's utility. So she's going to be interviewing a broad uh, slice of the population to try to construct the perfect health insurance that serves the general population. So two different philosophies, um, two different approaches. Now we're imagining these women as they prepare to construct a health insurance plan, they're going out and they're interviewing the people they care about. So what is this Rawlsian woman here when she interviews this top 1%? They care about diabetes management, they care about addiction treatments, they care about nursing home care, high quality nursing home care. They care about access to the most prominent cancer doctors out there, access to perhaps experimental treatments. They care about good coordination of care across different doctors. Those are the things they're very sensitive to. And of course, these people, because they go to the hospital a lot, they go to see the doctor a lot, they're very sick, they know the quality of care. If you have a lot of red tape, and if you don't allow them access to the top doctors, they know that for sure, because they have so much interaction with the healthcare system. Those are the people this Rawlsian woman is interviewing right now. And then the utilitarian woman, what is she here when she interviews the entire population? Well, if she's interviewing everybody, of course, she does hear some of the same things as the Rawlsian woman, but that's only 1% of the people she interviews. The vast majority of the people she interviews are these healthy people. They care about low prices, low co payments, low deductibles. They care about access to their primary care doctor. They're impressed with fancy technology. And a lot of them don't really know what they care about in their health insurance because they use it so infrequently. So after interviewing these, uh, the population, both of these women go back and construct a health insurance plan to serve the needs of the people they interviewed, on average. And of course, what happens when these two altruistic women offer their plans? Well, in this case, the Rawlsian woman is going to attract way more people from the top 1% of healthcare. However, because she tr attracts a greater share of those people, her costs are much higher. And if we sit down and do the numbers, let's, let's run some thought experiments. Let's say the Rawlsian woman attracts three times as many of the top 5% as she expected. What do her numbers look like? Well, that doubles her healthcare spending. And this is a diagram that sort of shows the math regarding that. What does she do about that? Um, she has a couple options. One is she could double the price of insurance if, she, if these people are paying on average for their care. That's going to be super expensive for them. Or she could cut services, get rid of some of the more expensive services. Those are her two options. Lower the quality or increase the cost to the customer. That's what you do if you accidentally attract too many of the sickest population. Now let's look at our utilitarian. We know that she is not attracting the top 5%, though that group is going over there. So suddenly her costs are way lower um, because the group of people she has attracted based on her plan are just much healthier and much cheaper to insure. So she has two options. Either she can cut cost sharing to the patient or she could take that extra money and invest it in higher quality care. This is the ironic thing with health insurance. A lot of times we say we want competition because that leads to innovation in these spaces. But which is going to be easier? Investing the money and actually improving the quality of care? That's expensive, it's time consuming, it's hard to get doctors to change behavior, or trying to attract a different group of patients, a healthier group of patients on average. Well, you know, between those two options, trying to attract, to selectively attract, certain types of customers, that's a much easier way of reducing costs and improving quality than actually doing the hard work it takes to innovate in healthcare. It's really hard to innovate in healthcare. So the easier approach is to take a selection approach. And is selection easy? Well, it might be, yeah, actually. What tools do insurers have for attracting a healthier share of the population? Do they have any um, techniques that they can employ? Well, yeah, they, they do. You can look at characteristics that are associated with healthier people. Healthier people are more likely to be employed. 
um, healthier people have higher cognitive ability on average. That's an interesting one because if you make your insurance complex enough and confusing enough, people with higher cognitive ability might be more likely to select it because they feel like they have a handle on all of the complexity. You can advertise in gyms. You can advertise at social events like galas where richer, healthier people are going to be. So there's lots of different techniques you can have for attracting um, patients who are on average healthier. And if you do that, that can make a huge difference in terms of cost which can be channeled into quality. The fact that when insurers compete, a big share of what they're competing for is the healthiest share of the population, that's a really difficult thing to deal with in health insurance. So I hope your mind is blown. This concept is a really powerful, important concept if you want to go into any sort of healthcare policy or healthcare administration. Adverse selection is almost always going to be at play.